How are you? I'm very well, thank you. That was a lovely introduction. Thanks for that. We're out of time for the interview, but it was a nice. <laughs> <laughs> It's a nice, nice introduction. Okay, nice seeing you. Bye. Yeah, see, yeah. T- take care of yourself. Um, <laughs> this is not something I've ever done before. Nice to see you, by the way. Thanks for what, interview me. somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you do it a lot. <laughs> I won an essay contest and came fourth. They were like, you know what? Well, we can, you can do the, you can do Canadian radio. I've never opened an interview with the end of somebody's book, but I, I want to read something you wrote at the end of the book. You said, okay. Stop everything. I have got breaking news. I think there is a very good chance that I am innately happy, joyful person who just needed 61 years to recognize it. What kind of trip has it been to get to that place? Um, I, I took the blinders off. It's been a crazy trip. And, and I've kept blinders on my eyes for most of my life because I didn't want to see things. I didn't want to hear things. I guess I had earplugs in too, but it all seeped into me anyway. And um, I finally realized that I was, I just wasn't living my life because I was so worried about what other people thought of me. I was raised that way. I was raised to care about what other people think of you. But the, what I found out through these 60, almost two years is that you can't make everybody like you. You can't. It's impossible. There's too many different kinds of people in this world. And and we all grew up in very different ways and very similar ways. But you can't make somebody like you. And the only person you can make like you is yourself. And you have the power over that. I had the power of that. I was so busy not liking myself and then noticing the people that didn't like me that I didn't enjoy all the people that were so loving and wonderful in my life. And it made me just open my eyes to... um, finding the good in life and not focusing on the negative because the negative is so much easier to focus on. It's so much easier to be angry, but it's a lot more, I hesitate to use the word challenging, but it is challenging to just be happy and be peaceful in the midst of all this freaking craziness that this world has to offer because it also has a lot of great stuff to offer as well. It is hard. It is hard. I, I think that that's, that's something you said there is not something that gets talked about enough. That I think we often hear, like, listen, you got to love yourself. Before you love anybody else, you got to love yourself. <laughs> right, right. I haven't heard too many people say, it's actually really hard to do. It's so hard to do. It's so hard to do because you're always having, I mean, especially with social media now, all those little trolls, they have a, they have a voice now and they can tell you however they feel. But what I've realized about all the trolls is that they're only coming to me because I'm a safe place to take it all out on. Yeah, yeah. If they don't like something about me, they can express it. No, no harm, no foul, because they they won't get any consequences for it. So it's easier to hear the bad stuff now. That's why we have to be stronger in ourselves. And I don't I'm not successful at this every day, but I'm getting more success, successful at it is we have to strengthen ourselves with that self-love, which sounds so like la 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 la. Yeah, well, I love myself and I like myself. And, and it's not it's really hard to do, but it but it's important because no matter what. um like God, universe, higher power, whatever you believe, it's all right, by the way. I've searched so many different ways. But um, we were brought here to bring joy and to connect with people on this big old rock floating in, in this weird old universe. And by denying ourselves that, but not by denying ourselves the joy, we're, we're, not, we're not living our lives. We're not making this. I mean, we're going to all be dead soon at one point why not have a good time while we're here yeah. why yeah. make it miserable so, so are you the book is called enough already is enough already to everybody else is enough already to yourself <laughs> it's enough already to myself it always it has to start with me it has to start enough already i uh, it's two ways i uh, enough already i don't i don't want to treat myself bad i don't want to look at the scale and see that number and be and be mad at myself anymore because that number was never ever ever made me happy no matter how low it was and of course how high it was it made me miserable but it never made me happy so enough already and also what i have learned is i am enough already we are all enough already what we have to offer is enough it is more than enough if we just open up and offer it i want to play you something take a listen to this I do not scream to get attention. No, you just scream. I heard you two months before I was born. (laughs) Why do you think I was late? I was scared to come out. That's my guest, Valerie Bertinelli, as the wisecracking younger sister, Barbara Cooper, 
with Mackenzie Phillips on the show one day at a time. How do you and Barbara help each other grow up? Oh, Barbara was one of the chapters in my, you know, in the book of life, in my book of my life. We all have other chapters and I don't know her very well anymore because she was so long ago. But the connection I have to her is someone that is still in my life who I love dearly. And that's Mackenzie. And we still have a connection and we still talk to each other. Um, And just having her in my life and everything that we've gone through. She was my first real sister. I grew up with brothers. I had a son. I don't know what it's like to be around women except my girlfriends. And she really was a sister to me as we were growing up. She would come over and spend the night. I would spend the night at her house. Um, We did drugs together. Uh, We just, we lived our lives together in in front of the public and behind. And um, I just, I love her dearly. How does growing up on camera mess with how you see yourself? I don't know, because this is how I grew up. So I don't know if that's messed with me or if what my dad has tried to teach me to to be has messed with me. It's all messed with me. But like, or affected (laughs) you. How how do you think it, how do you think it affects you growing up on a camera? Um, I think you can get very used to people doing things for you. And that's not necessarily a good thing. It's also a very good thing. I, I fought back at that so hard that I wouldn't let people help me. So now I've gotten to a point where it's like, oh, yeah, I, I need help with this. I, I can't do this alone. So um, I have noticed that it, it can work the opposite way, though, that people there's an expectation of, you know, get me a cup of coffee or, or yes, I want cold water. I, I prefer to get up and say, I'm getting some water. Does anybody else want some? There's just a so it can it, it can warp your brain that way, thinking everyone's there to serve you, and they're not. It's, and then growing up in the public eye, I just don't know anything else. I've been doing this since I was twelve. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm thinking like in terms of the journey you talk about in this book. People see you and your body, and your and they see you. You're that you're growing up, like yeah. the awkward stages of my teenageness which I, I'm in my mid thirties and I feel like I'm still in them, but the awkward stages, <laughs> will, yeah, the, the, the awkward <laughs> stages of my body changing, my life changing, everything changing. I tell you one thing, I didn't have to do it on TV in front of millions of people. Yes. Um, but just doing it on TV in front of millions of people is just the, the, so the small town is bigger. We all have our own small town. We all have our own bubble that we live in. We all have people judging us. Um, the town was just a little bit bigger that I lived in, but the, the words still hurt and the words still heal. So it doesn't matter how many of the words are, are thrown at you. One word can hurt you. And, and, um, it takes a hundred words to heal you, I think, um, of, of the kind words. So I don't really think it's that different. It's just a, maybe a little bit more magnified. Are you grateful that there was no Instagram and all that stuff then? Oh, for sure. For sure. I, I mean, I went through, I, I, I don't even want to, my twenties were a train wreck. I mean, I kept it, I kept going, but I just feel like I didn't like who I was in my twenties. I think it started to affect me that I was on television and people, you know, did things for me. And I think I started to get a little bit big in the head Yeah. and, um, I, I reeled that back hope, thankfully, but, um, yeah, I'm so grateful. I don't know that I could, bleh. yeah. Yeah, because you're also like, people can give you validation so easily, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or or they can cut you down so easily on the internet, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I want to I play another clip. Take a listen to this. Peel the eggplant carefully, making certain not to bruise the flesh. We did that. Couldn't we just order a pizza? In your letters, you said you love to cook. I do. That's, yes, I do. That's my guest, Valerie Bertinelli. In the 1982 made-for-TV comedy, I Was a Mail Order Bride with Ted Wass. What was that time like for you? Hey, I love that you're smiling when I play you that clip, by the way. So I was trying to figure out who it was because I remember making moussaka. I think it was moussaka that I was making in the movie. And I was a terrible cook in that movie, but I didn't remember which movie it was. Um, But I remember cooking. (laughs) I always remember cooking. Um, I'm sorry. What was your question? (laughs) I don't know if I got into it. What was that time like for you? Because you were in your 20s here. Like, what was what was this time like for you when you were trying to make your name outside of one day at a time? Uh, I was just determined. And um, every script that was brought to me, um, if 
it made, if I was afraid of something in it, like, oh, I don't think I can do this. It made me want to do it more. And it made me work with my acting coach more. And it made me, and I honestly, I do not know where that comes from because I, I feel as if, and I've always told myself this, you're lazy. You don't do shit. You just don't do that. You know, I mean, come on, work harder. And, and then I look back and I, I have someone go through, you know, my career and show me what I've done through all my years. I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I did work pretty hard. So I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't understand the way my brain works. I just don't. Yeah. Internalized shame is a weird thing. It is. Core shame is a weird thing, you know? Yeah. And also thinking that you don't deserve the success that you have. I never thought I deserved the success that I did have. And uh, a lot of the times it's like, I'm, I'm like, I'm a really average above. I'll give myself credit. I'm above average actress comedian. Um, and I've been able to work it this far into my sixties. I'm about to shoot a pilot in a couple of weeks with Demi Lovato. I've been able to make it go this far. I'm really lucky. And I'm not trying to be self-deprecating. I swear I'm not, it, but because when I do hit a line and get that laugh and it really works, I'm just as like amazed as, as, as anybody is. I'm like, Oh my God, that worked. That worked. And I always go back to the, it worked because the line was written so well, you know, it had nothing to do with what, with what I did. Demi Lovato, they have also grown up in front of a camera with people making fun of and comments about their bodies. Which I really don't understand. I mean, they get, they get, I would say go as far as tortured. Like people think they can say anything about Demi and it's not actually going to affect them. They're a human being, you know, why not let them, I see what Demi's doing and they are growing up in front of the world and I'm so proud of, of what they're exploring in their life and, and how they're um, trying to make all of this make sense. I was trying to do the same thing. I just, I love the way that they're going about it. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Can you relate? Can you and Demi relate to one another? Oh, for sure. For sure. I feel so prepared to play their mother. I, I'm, I'm super excited about it. I'm... Um, and they happen to be really good in this in this script. And it, the script was written by Suzanne Martin, who also wrote Hot in Cleveland. And Suzanne is just beyond brilliant at at um, at writing this particular type of comedy where um, you laugh so hard at something, and and the next minute you're crying because it just hits you so hard in the heart. I just I'm so excited to to shoot this. I can't wait to see it. Um, when that movie was coming out, by the way, the one we were just talking about, um, I was a mail order bride. You were a newlywed yourself. You and Eddie Van Halen were married in 1981. You were how old? In 81? Yeah. 21? And so this is a TV segment I want to play. Uh, if, if it's okay with you, I cannot play it if it's a bit hard, but a TV segment with you and Eddie talking about what it's like to share a house together. Take a listen. There were four years of uh, living in the nearest Holiday Inn was my address, you know. Mm-hmm. Now I got a home. You like that? Sure. Well, honey, when I met you, you were living with your parents. What is that? <laughs> Tell us what we heard just then. What does that bring to you? Mm. Oh, bossy McBosser. I was <laughs> so bossy. Um, oh, God, I love hearing his voice. Um, uh, yeah, it was. he was living in a Holiday Inn all around the country, all around the world. He lived out of a suitcase. Um, and when he did visit Los Angeles, he did live at his parents' house. And um, the parent, the house that they bought them, that Al and Ed bought them in Pasadena. And we went there quite often. Um, I, I feel lucky that I was able to give Ed that stability um, in the beginning there are so many regrets because I, I just, we were so young yeah. and I'm glad we came back to where um, the place we came in our back to in our relationship before he passed. Um, there's so many things I, I wish I could have done differently. I wish I could have been more compassionate. I wish I could have understood his pain more. I didn't even understand my own pain. So I didn't know how to uh, be compassionate with his and his was, uh, I don't like to compare people's pain, but to me, it was way worse than yeah. mine, what we've been through. So, um, 
Yeah, I I don't think there's anything wrong with regrets. I I I mean, people have them, uh, and I I try to learn from them and try to be a be a better person than I was, so I don't have to regret the new stuff. I mean, that's why I played those two clips together because I just wanted to point that you were you were a baby during all I was of this. A baby. Yeah, I was a baby, and maybe I'm too hard on myself because I really I I know I could have done so much better had I known more. Had I known what I know today, I could have I could have been so much better back then. But I guess I was supposed to learn all that to be the person I am today, and I'm going to be an even better person ten years from now. I hope. Let me reintroduce you here. My guest is the actor and Food Network host, Valerie Bertinelli. She's got a new memoir out called Enough Already, Learning to Love the Way I Am Today. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list for three weeks and counting now. So you come from this amazing Italian cooking family. Talk to people who don't know about the food that you were brought up with and what it meant to you. Oh, um, it was how love was introduced to me. It was it was um, watching my noni shape capelletti for the imbrotto that I, that I it was one, one of my favorite dishes, the capelletti imbrotto, which is this basically just really beautiful broth with these lovely little capellettis, which are meat filled um, pastas in them. It was my favorite thing that, that Noni and Aunt Adeline and, and my mom made. Um, just watching the way the women related to each other and, and the camaraderie when you're cooking together. Um, and I, and I, learned, and it, I probably soaked all this up as I was watching it, but I learned that, um, you know, that's what made my mother was accepted into that family. She's an English Irish Protestant, and she was accepted into this Catholic Italian family because she learned how to cook like them. Um, and my mom, you know, her mother died when she was nine. She didn't had a horrible stepmother, wasn't really happy with her father, had a very tough life. Yeah. And, you know, met this guy at 16, got pregnant, had um, got married and had a baby. And everybody in my dad's family was like, no, 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 no. You're supposed to marry an Italian. And and they did not treat my mom very kindly in the beginning. But um, she just she cooked better than Italians at some at, at some point. She just taught herself. She was determined. I wanted to ask something about your mom in, in the book, and only if you only if you want to talk about it, but you write about her telling People magazine back in the 80s, <laughs> Valerie could probably work on watching her weight a little more. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, first off, I can't imagine how that felt, and then how you come to- t- I believed it too. It's so stupid. I look back on pictures, and I'm like, how in the world did I think I was fat? How? Because of the crazy things that people and the same thing my mom grew up with. My mom was always, you know, my dad mistreated my mother when she would gain weight. So I learned and I've said this before. I've learned that when you gain weight, you're unlovable. So any ounce over 110 pounds, because that's when I was 16, that was on my driver's license. Who expects to be the same weight they are when they were 16 as they grow up? So I thought if anything over 110 pounds, I'm, you know, a big tub of lard, as I would put it back then. And um, that was a lie, a lie that I was taught because you don't grow up thinking that any weight is the wrong weight unless you're taught that we are enough already just as we are. But we're taught something different. And it's a big lie. How do you come to terms with your mom about that? Oh. I'm I'm not angry at her for saying that she she was taught the big lie as well. So um, I my I was always I always felt bad for my mom because she was such a beautiful woman. She never ever believed it ever. What's what's something you might cook if you are nostalgic or homesick? I know when I first moved to Toronto, so I'm from Newfoundland on the east coast of Canada which is a big fishing... Um, Near Halifax? About an hour and a half flight east of Halifax. Oh, I, okay. Out in the I middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so... Shake it, okay. So no, a, lot, a lot of salted fish. That's what we... Because uh, a lot, lot of salt salt fish, right? So... One uh, of Ed's favorite things was South Beheading. And when we went to Amsterdam, I mean, they would have like carts on the um, edge of the water and he would just like 
just pound it. I could, I finally found it in the market. Sell it that herring, and then you have the the herring with the sour the um, sour cream as well. There's nothing cooler to me than Eddie Van Halen walking out. It was eating, one of his favorite things. Eating salted herring. That's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. So, my, so salt cod is the big one for me. And when I first moved to Toronto, I was so homesick. I was so, I hated, I was so homesick. And on Saturdays, I would go to this Portuguese shop down the road where they had salt fish, like bacalao. Uh-huh. And it just made me feel so good. Yeah. Um, what's, what's that for you? Um, oh, anything like uh, lasagna, polenta, um, capelletti ambrotto. That I, I tried it for the first time. I hadn't had it in a long, long time. And I had gone to a, a restaurant locally called Moza and they actually have a uh, tortellini in Brodo, um, which is close. Tortellini is a little bit bigger. And I cried when I first tasted it. I felt like my grandmother was there. It's it, so that's what happens to it, food does that food brings a sense memory back that you can't do without it. And it's, it's the love you felt surrounded you, you know, when that food and, and, and the home, like you said, it, it, the homesickness kind of like goes away a little bit because you just feel like, ah. And you know, what's sticking out to me when you say that is that, so why am I messing with my relationship with something that gives me so much more than just sustenance? Right. I know it's insane because I listened to the lie more than I felt the love. Like I have to look a certain way. If I don't look a certain way, I'm not lovable. Oh my God. And now I'm in this business where every time that you do a wardrobe fitting, it's like, oh, couldn't we get you in a smaller size? Oh, why do we have to buy you this size? And it's never like lose weight. It's just, well, a few of the times it was, I did a mini series and um, uh, there was a paparazzi picture of me and, and the producer called my manager and said, oh my God, what's going on with her? I, I probably weighed 120 something pounds and they were upset that I, w- I looked like I had gained weight. But it's, it's just, I don't, it's warped. It's warped. That's why it doesn't matter what you look like and it shouldn't matter what you look like. What am I here to offer you? I can offer you love. I can offer you food. I can offer you comfort. I can offer you humor. I can, I can just make you feel good. Does it really matter what the fuck I look like? Sorry. Curse all you want. You're Valerie Britton. You can do whatever you want. Okay. Um, enough already is what you're saying there. So that's yes, yeah, enough yeah, already. Yeah, enough. I'm enough. I want to I want to go back to food in a second, but I want to play you this. Take a listen to this. Action, Valerie. I, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> I know what action means. So do I, but it's been so long. <laughs> That's my guest, Valerie Bertinelli. And who is that? Betty, Betty White, the one and only. Oh, my God. I adore that woman. I just absolutely like the, talk about an instant smile on your face when she walks into a room. I'm just, I just I love her. And she that was so insane that she because there was a line I kept tripping up. And then that was the director, Andy. And um, he said, action. So I'm about to go action. And I always was riffing with him. I absolutely adore him. And so I would always give him a hard time. And that's why I did that. And she's just sitting there watching the other thing out of the top. Just boom. I don't know where, how that thought came to her mind, but that's how quick she is. Do you get a good Betty story? Oh, uh, so many. Well, that one right there. Um, just, oh God, a good Betty story. They're all good. Um, I would send her uh, little videos She's named my dog, Luna, and she also named my first foster failure, Nelson, because she always wanted a cat named Nelson Eddie, but she did, couldn't get a cat. I mean, just the last 10 years of her life, she was like, I can't get a new animal. Yeah. You know, I don't know where I'll be. And I'm like, Betty, you're living forever, but she didn't. Yeah. And um, once Pontiac, her her last dog died, we were all like, oh God, that's got to be so hard on her. But yeah. um, I, all, uh, oh. I, you would think I would have a million of them and nothing just comes to mind right now. Oh, that's kind um, of what happens oh. when you say, can you tell me a story about her? But I don't yeah. know. You never know, right? <laughs> just because how, just she was just so quick. I mean, I, I've said this a million times. People are going to get sick of it. But I tell you, I tell you, the woman glowed. I, 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 I was shocked by like she would just there was like this aura around her that even us regular people could see. You didn't have to be. um a psychic or a seer wanted to, to see that aura around her. So hold on. So you're, you're cast in hot in Cleveland. And then right after something happens and you say like, I got to go to Italy. Tell me that story. Well, I planned the Italy trip before, um, 
before I actually got cast in it, or did I, I, I don't know, that it was 12 years ago. Um, I just felt like I want to know my my home country. I still want to get to Ireland as well, because um, I, I want to find that, those part of my roots. But um, And I was supposed to go in May, um, right before COVID shut everything down in March. The food's not as good as I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I, I, well, yes, but it's different. Yeah. And I, I am out on a quest to find, like, I think Irish food is kind of amazing. I really do. And, and Scottish food and, um, another, it's of my background. It's the food I grew up with. I mean, I love it more than anything, but it's also like, you know, you move up here and you have a bit of pasta and you go like, well, I don't, I don't miss the corned beef as much, <laughs> but, so, but, but why did you have to go? Why did you have to go to Italy? Cause I'd never been. And even because I had been all around the world with Ed and I couldn't believe that I'd never been to Italy of all places. So I just, I really, I felt this yearning that I couldn't not go any longer. But I feel like when you were in Italy, something changed for you. Like you, I'm trying to remember the story here now. Like I realized food wasn't the enemy. T- t- talk to me about that. I, I realized that good food, um, food in itself is not the enemy. It was the way that I had treated it because I, I ate heartily and happily and without guilt. Um, and I didn't gain an ounce because I didn't, I wasn't sitting around, uh, judging myself. I wasn't, um, snacking at the, you know, in the middle of the night, I wasn't hungry. I just, I was so, everything was just so perfect. The food was just so good. I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't using food to fill up an emotion that I didn't want to feel because I was feeling all the wonderful emotions that you can feel when you're in a place that you love. And isn't that amazing that you have that experience and then Food Network happens? Yes. It's, um, wow. I I just think I'm just so lucky. Just so lucky. Well, it, 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 it really inspired me to write a book, a cookbook. And I wanted to wrote, write about all the recipes that I had learned growing up and also learning about new cultures. Mrs. Van Halen opened my eyes to a whole new um, side of food that I had never seen before. And I absolutely loved the spiciness of all the Indonesian dishes that she taught me. Um, so I did the cookbook. And once the cookbook was successful, I, that's when I went to Food Network because I had been watching Food Network since it premiered. Yeah. Rachel Ray was on all the time. I mean, the food food network was on all the time. I love Giada, Rachel, Ina, all of, you know, all of them. And I wanted to do a show traveling around Italy and finding my roots and, and finding out why I felt su- such a connection there and, and such a connection with the food. They said, we really don't want to do a travel show, but um, do you want to do an ITK? And what's I didn't a, know what's what that What's an was. ITK? In the kitchen. Oh. So, and then I was like, what's an ITK? And they told me, it's like Rachel, it's like, you know, Pioneer Woman, Giada, la, la, la. And I was like, yes, I would love to do that. Had no idea how I was going to do it. Cooking on camera is very different than cooking at home. Um, so I, it was, but it was fun and I still enjoy it. I'm about to go into my 14th season. 14th season. How does doing a show like that affect the way you see yourself? In the beginning, um, I still was nervous about the way I looked because I could see that I was starting to gain weight. I started gaining weight as soon as I broke my foot, um, in 2014. And I was nervous about how people would judge me like, Oh, she was this, you know, big, uh, diet spokesperson. And now she's doing a cooking show and these aren't diet foods. What am I supposed to believe? So, I had a little problem trying to figure that out. Like, well, I'm just human. I'm not always on a diet and I don't always want to be on a diet. And these are the foods that I grew up loving and, and the people that made them I love. So it was, it was hard. Now I'm at a comfortable place with it. I'm a bit, I'm a bit pissed off to be honest. Like I know at the very beginning when you were like, um, Oh, Tom, it's just a small town, you know, uh, you know, even my small town was a little bit bigger than yours. That's all it is. I'm a little pissed off that just like you can't just have a career without a bunch of fucking arseholes. Oh, my God. I can't be cursing like this on my radio show <laughs> without a, a bunch of bleep and bleepers uh, making comments about your weight, for God's sake. That's all they do. Yeah, I, that's all they do. And um, most of the time I'm strong enough to say, you know what? Screw you. It doesn't matter how much I weigh. Yeah. I mean, just because I don't weigh myself any longer and I don't want to. um 
make my self-worth about what I look like. It doesn't mean I still don't want to take care of myself. I still don't try to, you know, I try to eat more vegetables and fruit. I try to drink less alcohol, try to eat less sugar. Cause it just mainly because alcohol and sugar don't make me feel as good yeah. as when I eat fruits and vegetables. So I want to feel better. And if that ends up, you know, where my weight kind of stabilizes to a place where I don't ever have to buy a bigger pair of jeans, then great, cool. I'm happy but I don't ever want to be loved or not loved because of the way I look. So, How did I make you feel? That's all I want to know. How did I make you feel? Well, you're making me feel great right now. I, I have <laughs> right here, by the way, a slice of the Sicilian chocolate love cake. <gasps> you do not. Oh my God, that looks beautiful. Who made it? Jen, our producer of this segment, Jen Warren, she made the cake Jen, for this. Jen, that's beautiful. What do you think of it? She did an amazing job. It switched layers so perfectly. I am impressed. So can we? Can you describe it for people? I, so I, I wasn't allowed to eat it yet because they want Jane wanted me to have the first bite with you on screen. Can you oh, can I'm you so tell excited. people what it is? Uh, what it is before we get into it? It's it's a, a beautiful luscious chocolate cake, um, and what you do is that's the one layer, and then on top of that luscious cake batter, that delicious chocolatey cake batter, you do this marzipan and ricotta uh, filling. I, 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 you know, quote unquote filling, you lay that on top of it while it's in the oven, the, the ricotta and the marzipan, marzipan are so mispronounced. I'm so excited. I'm literally drooling looking at that. Um, they switch layers because uh, the, it's so heavy. The cheese layer is so heavy. It switches to the bottom. And, uh, and then for the frosting, it's just instant pudding and some more marzipan, marzipan, <laughs> mascarpone. Um, instant pudding? Instant pudding. Yes. And, and milk and um, yeah, it's not, and the, it's not fancy. No, 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 no. I don't cook fancy. I cook so everybody can cook. I want everyone to feel comfortable in the kitchen and cooking. What does this, what does this cake represent to you? And please answer quickly so I can have a bite of this. Love. love. That's a, a bite full of love, a spoonful of love. I'm going to try it. I haven't had like chocolate have, cake and um, mascarpone. And ricotta, you'll love it. All right, have a look. I'm so impressed with whoever baked that. That looks beautiful. Look at that. <laughs> That's incredible. Isn't that good? <laughs> it's so good. I'm, I'm taking some meaning. I'm talking with my mouthful. I'm taking some meaning. I'm covering my mouth, even though I'm on the radio, by the way. <laughs> I'm taking some meaning in the fact that it's not fancy. It's not everyone else's idea of what goodness is. Yeah, it doesn't have to be fancy for it to taste good. I you know, I mean fancy food is fun too. Don't get me wrong. I love going to a great restaurant and having the chef, you know, make up something fancy that he's gone to culinary school for, you know. But I also I'm I also love watching, you know, Mrs. Van Halen, you know, whip up a bowl of balmy and my mom cook a perfectly roasted chicken. So there's, you know, food doesn't have to be fancy. What, what, how did this love cake help you turn things around at the Food Network? Can you tell me that story? Um, oh, right. Because when I went, um, I took a boot camp at uh, the kitchens, the famous Food Network kitchens uh, in Chelsea Market. And um, we were doing some recipes with my culinary producer, Mary Beth Bray, who is now our executive producer. And I was so nervous because this is where all the great people are. They were filming Chopped right around the corner. Um, Alex Guarnaschelli would walk in once in a while and I was like, oh my God, it's Alex Guarnaschelli. Now she's a friend and I was just like like in awe of her, still am. Um, so by the last, I think it's the last day, I said, okay, I, let's make the love cake or she suggested making the love cake because I was going to make it on one of the first shows. And when I finished it, I was so proud of it. And I, and what you do there is there's so much food as people are, the test kitchens are around the corner for the magazine, all that stuff. So you put all the food out and everybody in the kitchen, they, when it's lunchtime, everybody eats a little bit of whatever people cook that day. And the cake just went like everybody ate it and everybody loved it. And it, my heart just swelled. It's like, Oh, I've been accepted. Everybody loves the love cake. Can you tell me about the 21 gram diet? Yes. So, um, they say, whoever the big they are, that when you die, um, your body weighs 21 grams less. So is that your soul that leaves your body? Is that how much your soul weighs? So by doing the 21 gram diet, you're doing things to feed your soul. 
to, to make you happy, to make you full of joy, to make you be grateful, to, to make you kind. And as you, as you do those steps of being kind and being grateful and being compassionate, you feed your soul. And that's the 21 grams. I want to play you one more thing before we go. It's not you this time. Valerie, can you tell me what that is and why we might be playing it for you? That is the song that Wolfie wrote for Ed and put out um, after Ed passed. I am, um, he finished it up after his dad passed. Um, he was writing it and Ed had heard all the music. So, um, and Ed absolutely loved it. Loved it. Loved all of it. But that that song just hits hard. Um, it's just just those lyrics alone. Um, that is one thing I am grateful for, that he is no longer in pain and he is in a much better place than being down here where he was in so much pain. I'm so happy you guys were able to be together at the end. Yeah, I really am, too. We had come full circle, come around and. um I wish we'd had some more time though, because we were really, um, really connecting and then freaking COVID just separated us again. And it just made it so challenging, um, to get together a lot of texting and a lot of, um, FaceTime, but, um, ugh, fucking COVID. If you could go back to that first clip, I played you, you and Mackenzie, who mm-hmm. you were back then and say something to her, what would you say? You're not fat. You're, you're okay. Just, you're just, you're perfect just the way you are. I mean, as much as perfect can be where none of us are perfect, but you're not fat. Don't believe them. It's a lie. You're enough. You're enough. You're enough already. <laughs> um, it may sound so trite to say you're not fat, but I got, I mean, and I know that people are sick of me talking about my weight, but I'm telling you, it led my life for far too long. And I just, it's such a wrong way to lead a life when there's so much, so much around me to be, to be grateful for and to, to enjoy. And I'm just, I don't want to be angry any longer. How is the process? And maybe this is a good way to close things off. Cause I want to get back to the cake. Mm-hmm. How is the process of learning to love yourself going these days? Quite well. Thank you. Um, I, I have a lot of travel coming up, so I'm, I, I'm, my anxiety is starting to kick in again. And I've learned lessons from Andy, Angie Johnsy, who I talk about in the book. Um, and you can find online if you, if you like to, she's really gets good lessons on how to quell the anxiety by listening to it and talking to it and not trying to push it away. It's by pushing things away and shoving things down and not dealing with them that all the bad stuff happens. So I've, I, I literally woke up at three o'clock this morning anxious as I'll get out. And I was just like, okay, let's come here. And I'm talking to myself in the middle. What's up? Let's just, you and me anxiety. Let's have a good talk right now because you're obviously not being heard. I, you don't feel heard from me. So let's, let's hug it out. And then tell me what you're, what's really bothering. Where in my body are you like settling right now? And, and I knew it was about, tra- and then it started coming about travel and being away for two months. And I don't, you know, there's, yes, there's going to be people taking care of my animals, but they don't take care of them the same way I do and all that kind of silly stuff. But I, I would, I would suggest to anyone when those anxious feelings come up, talk to them, don't shove them away, find out what they want, find out what they're, they're trying to protect you from um, and talk to them and tell them that you're here for them and you're okay right now. You let's, let's just work this out together. Valerie Bertinelli, what a joy it was to talk to you. 